I welcome you in the name of the Lord, and I welcome Randy and Debbie all the way from Kingman. <laughs> Actually, all the way from Healdsburg, California, in Northern California, to Kingman, to here. Welcome. Good to have you with us. And Vonda, welcome back. Good to see you again. And hey, Doug, it's good to see you too. <laughs> good to have you both here. All right, I think, uh, I don't think we have another visitor, but anyway, um, we do have, tomorrow is an anniversary. John, you know anything about tomorrow? Do you have an anniversary tomorrow? Oh, John, your wife called and said to remind you that you have a, an anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> 18? Great. I'm sure glad we reminded you. <laughs> I caught him off guard. I had it. I remembered it last week and I knew it was coming. Yeah, but you know, if you don't remember it tomorrow, it's curtains, buddy. Anyway, congratulations. And believe it or not, we missed announcing Jim King's birthday. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, every week is Jim's birthday. Um, <laughs> So, yes, but uh, Jim, a little belated happy birthday to you. Who did? Two weeks ago. Okay, anyway, belated happy birthday and happy anniversary again. Okay, you probably remembered your birthday, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Oh, really? <laughs> All right, anyway, some announcements for you. Um, we, have, we started this morning a series on the book of uh, Romans in Sunday school class, and that will be going for a number of weeks, just to let you know if you haven't heard. We're studying the book of Romans at Sunday school, 9.30 in the morning on Sundays. Um, invite you to join with us. Tonight um, is really a special message. We, every now and then I do a message on a contemporary issue. And I want to do something tonight that I've titled Critical Race Theory. What is it and why should we care? If you're not familiar with critical race theory, you should be. Um, this is taking over our country, our legal system, our political system, and many of our churches. And uh, we need to be aware of it. And so tonight will be kind of an overview. Critical race theory. What is it and why should we care? Um, that's tonight at uh, 6 o'clock. On Wednesday at 7 p.m., our time of prayer and praise to the Lord every Wednesday night. And then on Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, our men's and women's Bible studies meet here. The men meet up here. The women meet downstairs. Next week will be the last week for Emmanuel's Child. And thank you for the really enthusiastic response that we've received to this ministry. Um, if you... Did, should I say anything else about it, honey? I know you kind of briefed me, but. We've run out of ornaments, which is wonderful, but we'll still take donations if you are of a mind to do that because the money will be used wisely by the Slavic Gospel Association. All right, and we found out just this week, I mean, we had the information, but just discovered that we can actually designate, Jerry, you probably knew this, we can actually designate our money to go to, um, our missionaries in the Ukraine. Um, so we can directly assist their ministry. And they have a lot of young people, a lot of children in their ministry there. So we will do that. And so you will be directly contributing toward one of our missionary families in doing that. So with that, I invite you to stand, please. We're going to sing hymn number 245, Rejoice the Lord is King. And then please remain standing for the reading of God's word and for prayer. And Gary will be leading us in that ministry this morning. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
has asked me to read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose stream, streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her in the morning dawn, when the morning dawns. The nation made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. Our God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank you for these words and we realize how close they are to describing our world today. The challenges that we face, the challenges that we endure, we pray, Lord, that we will continually remember that you are our sovereign God, that you are the one in charge, that through your voice, through your power, things happen according to your will. And we would ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand, to very clearly realize what your will is for us as individuals, for us as a church community, for us as a nation, that we might just do your will according to your plan, according to your time, that you may receive the glory and honor. We do raise up before you, Lord, the needs of this particular congregation. We think of those who have health concerns. We ask, Lord, that you would be with David in his uh, scheduling of his surgery and pray, Lord, that you would be with the doctors that perform that according to your timetable. We pray that you would give him complete and quick healing. We think of Diane, Lord, and ask that you would be with her as she continues through her treatment. Give her the sustenance she needs to endure. We pray that you would also be with David as he continues in his health concerns. And ask, Lord, that your will would be done, that those uh, affected would re realize your healing capability. There are others in our church, Lord, who need a touch from you uh, physically. Uh, materially, perhaps, financially, emotionally, we ask that you would be with each of them, that you know their needs, that you would just help them to recognize your will for their life. And uh, that is a prayer for each of us, Lord, that we may just realize what you would have us to do in your name, that the glory would be brought to you. We do pray, Lord, that you'd be with uh, our uh, supported missionaries in the field, that you would give them good health, that you would give them the strength, give them endurance, and pray, Lord, that as they go forth to uh, spread your love and your word through uh, uh, unknown worlds to us, that uh, your will would be done there as well. We think of our outreach in our own community through the schools and through uh, uh, nursing homes. And pray, Lord, that you would just be with each individual uh, as they go forth and share your love with those around them. Uh, once again, that praise and honor and glory would be returned to you. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with our pastor, that he would uh, be able to sh uh, sh uh, share the word, the break the bread of life to us as we go through our study today, that your name again would be glorified. Uh, we bring this all to you in the name of our Lord Jesus, our, uh, our provider and our sustainer. In his name we ask, amen. 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 Please be seated. <coughs>
Thank you, Gary. That was an appropriate and a much appreciated um, pastoral prayer. Thank you. And ask Joe Souza if you would come up here, please, Joe. We have the privilege today of affirming Joe as a, the newest member of our church. I have had the privilege of meeting with Joe um, weekly for 18 years. <laughs> no, two or three years. I've lost track. Almost four. Almost four? Almost four. Really? Yeah. Um, he was much younger and shorter when I first met him. <laughs> now, Joe is, has become a dear friend and um, a great encouragement to me and to our church family over the time that he's been here. And uh, he applied for membership a while back, and it is our joy to affirm that membership today. What I like to do, actually what is important to do, and I must do this according to our Constitution, but it's a joy for me to do it, is to read the membership commitment that um, Joe has already affirmed, but then to ask if you specifically affirm it in front of the congregation. It reads this way. Having been born again by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and being justified on the ground of his shed blood, and having confessed my faith before men, I do now in the presence of God and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into this commitment with my fellow members uh, as one local portion of the body of Christ. I commit, therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in Christian love, to strive for the advance of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, disciplines, and doctrines, and to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the relief of its poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. I also commit to maintain family personal devotions, to educate my children, if the Lord should give you any, uh, in, the, in the Lord's word, in God's word, and to seek the salvation of my kindred and acquaintances. By the grace of the power of God and as a stranger and pilgrim in this world, I commit to abstain from fleshly lusts and worldly practices that war against the soul, and to forsake all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, and to be kind to my fellow Christians, tender-hearted, forgiving them even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. I further commit to watch over my fellow members in brotherly love, to remember them in prayer, and to help aid them in sickness and in distress. And there are accompanying scripture references for all of those commitments. Joe, do you affirm publicly that this is your heart and that this is your commitment? I do. Great. It is my joy, actually, to call on a, an official affirmation, those members of this church who affirm Joe's membership, just do so by raising your hand, please. Great. Anyone did not affirm? I knew that, because we've already given you time to answer any questions you may have. Joe, this is Joe's membership certificate. Would you like to say something? Uh, I just, I know I've been here for a long time, and. I don't know, I just never really thought about uh, officially putting it on uh, paper and in the files and being on board as a member of the church is just something that just slipped my mind. But uh, I've always thought of myself as a member of this church for years and I've gotten to know all of you. And so I'm just grateful to let you know that, uh, that I do want to be a member of this church. So thank you. Joe, love you brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, just to keep it nice and oh, clean. Thank you. Thank you. On the membership form, there's a line that says, what ministries do you anticipate being involved in in the church? And one of what Joe said and underlined is, anyone who needs help, I want to be available. So he has a heart for helping, and he's already done that in numerous situations. So if you have any needs around the house or anything that, that you just can't get done, um, Joe would like to help with that if his work schedule uh, permits. Thank you, Joe. God has given us the gift of music. It was done with hearts directed in love towards our Lord and Savior. What a blessing, the opportunity to praise our Lord. We're going to sing this next song, Sing to the Father with Words of Praise.
heaven declares. If you ever go out, out of the city lights and just look up at the stars, the heavens, see what the Lord has created, you think of his beauty, but think of his the power and majesty, all the order that he's placed <coughs> throughout his creation, and just marvel at our <coughs> creator God. All heaven declares. Let's, let's stand with this one. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, as we continue our study of this wonderful book. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 will be our text for this morning. Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, before we begin this particular portion of study, I invite you please to bow with me. We'll ask the Lord once again to uh, be very present in the person of his spirit in terms of his power in our lives and the work that he does through the study of his word. Our Father and our Lord Jesus, we sing that you, Lord Jesus, are the Lamb upon the throne. You will always be there. You are interceding for your precious elect ones. You are representing us to the Father as only you can. What a marvelous thing to know that we come into the presence of the Father, God the Father, the God of the universe, through the veil of your flesh because of the sacrifice that you made on the cross so that we might have access directly to the Father. Lord Jesus, thank you. Father, thank you. Thank you for the plan of salvation. Thank you for calling us to salvation. Those of us who are here, who love you, who have bowed the knees to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would, in fact, by your Spirit, do your work in us this morning to make us more like Jesus. I thank you for this passage. I thank you for Paul. I thank you for how you directed his life and through him produced so much Scripture Scripture that is precious to us, Scripture that is a treasure to us, and Scripture that we are committed to learn from and to walk accordingly by your grace. Thank you for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I've titled this, The Lowliness 
of leadership, the lowliness of leadership, which may sound somewhat contradictory if you're familiar with the typical strong natural leader model. Uh, biblical Christians, biblical leaders are not strong natural leaders in that sense. We are servant leaders. Jesus Christ came to save. He came to serve and we are to follow his example. What Paul is giving us in this passage and really on through what he's already given us in chapter three, now in the first part of chapter four and through the remaining of the chapter, he's going to expand on what it looks like to be a faithful servant of the Lord. He's giving us a biblical model of leadership, something of a theology of spiritual leadership. This is especially important for those of us who are called to lead in the local church, but it is important for all of us to know how to pray for spiritual leaders, what to expect from spiritual leaders, how to encourage and hold accountable spiritual leaders, but especially for us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ as servant leaders. And then for you others who are not leaders in the church per se, but who are Christians, leaders in your own family, uh, exemplary examples of what Christianity looks like in your own sphere of influence to know these principles as well because the principles filter out into all of Christianity. We as leaders need to be exemplary, which is not to say that I am. It's just that this is what I'm called to be and when I fail, it is especially grievous to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit because of the position to which I've been called. Um, but I'm in process just like all of you are in process. But you need to know the, the guidelines, the parameters, the principles, all of that, because you are all servants of the Lord Jesus Christ in your own sphere of influence, in your own hearts. So these principles have their apex in a sense. Well, they have their apex in Jesus Christ. But for spiritual leaders, we need to especially pay attention. But as Christians in general, every Christian needs to understand we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is giving us here that theology, if you will, of spiritual leadership, the model that we are to follow. And elsewhere, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And every spiritual leader should say that, follow me as I follow Christ, but only as I follow Christ. And that's what Paul meant, follow him, but only as he follows Christ. So the lowliness of leadership. Now, leading up to this passage, in chapter for Paul continues really what is an ongoing rebuke and correction of the Corinthians because so many of them were exalting themselves, dishonoring Christ, causing jealous and prideful divisions within the church, which should never have been. And it was especially grievous to Paul and to others, but especially Paul, when they were dividing over their teachers and some were pridefully saying, well, well, I'm of Paul, and others were saying, well, I'm of Apollos, well, well I'm of Cephas or Peter, uh, and, and there was division and factions over that, and it was causing enormous problems in the church. Those aren't our problems necessarily, but we can relate to them. When, if we slip into a prideful mode, like how much I know about Scripture, or, or who my teacher is, or where I came from, or the church that I used to go to, or, or whatever, we have to be really, really careful about that because the seeds of this are in every church, especially when we have so much influence, we have so much input, and that's good, but it can be also divisive. We have the internet, we have books, we have, well, you understand, we have so much media, and, and if we go to the right people and learn the right things, that is, that is a huge blessing, but it can be an enormous burden as well, especially if, we, if we're learning something that is incorrect biblically, or if we're taking pride in what we know, you, you understand the principle. So Paul is dealing with it here in a very obvious way, and he's continuing now in chapter four to address that situation. But in addressing it, what he's doing is he's saying, and I'm paraphrasing, really paraphrasing, he's saying, listen guys, these men whom you are in a sense worshiping, whom you are holding up, as I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas and so on, these men, are not to be up there. They're to be valued for what they are, properly and biblically, but they are not to be exalted over Christ. They, they are not the foundation of the church. Christ is the foundation of the church. 
And so we need to, we need to be, just be very careful of that. So after confronting them, he continues now by telling them this is what leaders are in the sight of God, and this is how you should view them and how you should respond to them rather than what you're doing in a sinful way. So after telling them in chapter 3 that they are thinking and acting like unbelievers, like mere babes in Christ, he reminds them that their teachers are servants of Christ and should be viewed as such. In fact, in chapter 1, verses, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5-7, through 7, he says, Well, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted... Apollos watered, but God was causing the grow. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he's not saying that the spiritual leaders are nothing. That's not his point at all. His point is God should be glorified. Again, the foundation is Christ, and we build on that foundation. Those who plant the seeds of the gospel the seeds of biblical truth, those who water them by encouraging and instructing and holding people accountable. Those are all very, very important, and they have their place. But it is God who is to be exalted. It is God who is to be glorified. That's really the bottom line principle here. Paul goes on to say that faithful Christian leaders build the church on the foundation of Christ with quality materials or works working for the church, under the leadership of Christ, under the leadership of the Spirit, and they use what Paul calls quality materials or works, gold, silver, precious stones. Those are the word pictures of what we should be doing as we lead the church, building in that way. But there are others who are Christians and who are leaders, specifically in the text, who are building with wood, hay, straw, And when the judgment comes and we'll all stand before the Lord at some point in the future and he will evaluate our works. And Paul uses the picture of a fire that burns and it burns hot. And it purifies gold, it purifies silver, it does its work. But wood, hay, stubble, straw are burned up. And they have no value eternally is the point. But those deeds, those works... Um, the efforts that build the church properly on the foundation of Christ constitute gold and silver and precious stones. And they will not only endure the fire and survive the fire, they will be purified by the fire and they will have implications and applications for all eternity. And that boils down to every Christian. We saw last week that it isn't only spiritual leaders who will face the judgment seat of Christ, but all believers will stand before him. We also saw that when Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ, he's not talking about the judgment of condemnation or the judgment of sins. He's talking about what is known in the Greek as the Bema seat, which is a place where the Olympic athletes would receive their awards, would receive their rewards. And that's what Paul is talking about. When spiritual leaders or just all Christians are stand before the Lord, we will receive rewards or we may suffer loss, depending on the quality of what we've done with our lives and our ministries. We will all face the Lord in that way. So for the believer, the Bema seat is not a place of condemnation for sin. Our sins were paid in full on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verse 1, Therefore now there is no condemnation. How much? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. See, the Bema seat is not a place where we are judged for our sins. That has been taken care of by the Lord. We will be evaluated for our works. That's the point. So for the believer, again, the Bema seat is a place where Christ evaluates his or her works and grants rewards for faithful service. Some will suffer loss, but that is not a salvation issue in this context. It is the loss of rewards, which, and I really can't explain what it means to lose 
rewards other than kind of pulling together some implications and applications from Scripture. And it seems to me to diminish our capacity to serve the Lord in eternity. It seems to me to diminish the full glory that we want to bring, the joy of bringing full glory to Christ because, as Paul says elsewhere, we don't want to be ashamed at His coming. We suffer some kind of shame and we're not able to present to Him that the full measure of our own lives, our own works uh, that we've built on because we've built on wood, hay, and stubble. And I really believe that every believer will suffer some loss because we're not perfect. And every believer will of course, gain rewards, but we want our lives to matter for the Lord. We want to present. uh, The New Testament in Revelation calls them crowns. We want to be able to cast our crowns at him. That's a picture. I'm not sure how that works out or or what it'll look like, but I do know that we want to glorify Christ uh, to the maximum when we're in his presence and for all eternity. So we don't want to lose rewards is the point. Now, I want to give you an overview of biblical works. This is kind of a side study, a study within a study. This past week, uh, because last week's message dealt primarily with the rewards or losses of church leaders, someone asked me to clarify more fully what it means for Christians who are not spiritual leaders to produce works that will be rewarded or works that will suffer loss, be burned up. And I'm happy to do that. And I want you to know that the fact that it was my wife who asked me to do that has absolutely no bearing on the fact that I'm doing it. (laughs) Actually, (laughs) on Thursday, um, our men's Bible study had quite a discussion on this very topic. And so that reinforced the thought in my mind, I should take some time to take you through this. Much of what I'm about to say will be review for you, but I think it's a necessary review. So there's no question at all with regard to works and works that are um, gold and silver and precious stone as over against works that will be burned up, wood, hay, stubble. So I want to do that for just a few minutes before we progress into chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. Let me begin with this. When Scripture speaks of good works, this is New Testament. When New Testament speaks of good works, it's referring to works that follow one's salvation. Works that flow out of the Holy Spirit's work within the believer. It's works that follow salvation and which are produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer. You may recall in... um, Matthew 13, Jesus gives the parable of the soils, the seeds in the soil, and and the the seed is the proclamation of the kingdom, and it falls on different soils. When it falls on the good soil, it produces fruit. But Jesus says some tenfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. Believers' lives will have different quantities of fruitfulness, depending on a number of factors. It isn't all the same. It isn't all a given that everybody's going to produce 100% fruit. Okay. There will be levels of fruit, if you will. That's not the best way to say that. But there will be different degrees of fruitfulness. So when the New Testament speaks of good works, and the way I'm using it here, it's talking about those works that are produced in the life of every believer following salvation. It's not referring to works that produce salvation. Major distinction, I think most of you, if not all of you, understand that. Scripture condemns the efforts on the part of men and women to somehow merit something in the sight of God towards salvation. Because that that is an affront to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament calls them uh, filthy rags, and that's a very graphic term. It's like, okay, I'm going to spend my whole life working toward my salvation. It's for an unbeliever. And I'm building up this whole pile of filthy rags. And when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to drag that whole stinking mess in front of him and say, here's why you should accept me into heaven. Because look what I've done. And it's going to be putrid and offensive to the Lord. And he will say, no, no, I never knew you. Depart from me. It means nothing. So it's very important to understand 
works before salvation that are working towards salvation, which are condemned by Scripture, or works that salvation produces, which are commended by Scripture. We're talking about those works. You're familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Nobody's going to get to heaven and say, I did it, God. Aren't you proud of me? I did enough to earn my way into your presence. No one's going to boast. It's all of God's faith. For he, it's all of our faith produced by God in us. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And the phrase walk in them refers to a lifestyle, to live our lives according to the good works that God has produced in us because we are his workmanship. In Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, which means those good works were done for the glory of God. And those who saw them understood that to be so. Additional, Jesus said, and this is Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done as the fruit of his or her salvation is the point there. So we are created for good works and are to walk in them. In fact, they should characterize our lives. If we are professing Christians... We should be characterized by the fruit of that salvation. Good works, God-honoring works. Another word for works that salvation produces in the life of a believer is fruit. And these are synonymous. They're used interchangeably in Scripture. For example, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 The fruit of the Spirit, this is the fruit that the Spirit produces in the life of a believer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What does that mean? It means that all of these are acceptable in the sight of God. All of these characteristics and the fruit of behavior patterns that flow out of them is gold, silver, precious stones to the Lord. They're not just acceptable, okay, I'll accept that. No, he he commends them. This is how we honor the Lord and glorify him in this life. So those are attitudes and character traits that the Holy Spirit produces within the believer. And they find their expressions in works or deeds or actions that are pleasing to the Lord. And those attitudes and character traits should permeate each of our lives. Not perfectly, because again, we're all in process, but characteristically. Um, If we're professing to be a Christian, it should be obvious because of the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control that characterizes our lives. Now, keeping your finger, and if you're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, waiting for me to get there, kind of keep your finger there and turn, please, to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to see verses 9 through 12, because here Paul gives us some practical illustrations of the fruit of the Spirit that produces things that honor God, that glorify God in our lives. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. This is one of Paul's prayers. He's heard of their love, for the Lord, and he's heard of their love for the saints, and he's heard of their faith in Christ. So his response to that, for this reason also, verse 9, since the day we heard of those things, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We want your behavior to be informed by spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding, which, of course, is contained in God's Word. That's why we devote ourselves to study of God's Word, because those principles are what transform our lives through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says, so that you may, here it is, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, 
I've told you before that word worthy is, is an accounting term. It has to do with balancing the scales. It doesn't mean that, well, now I'm worthy of God. That's not the way Paul uses it, ever. It means balance the scale. Our profession of faith and Christ's example should become increasingly balanced. Okay. So, be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, consistent with the Lord, consistent with His will, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Notice how, notice how He links fruitfulness with good works and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul's saying that spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding produce a lifestyle or a walk that is pleasing to the Lord. Again, gold, silver, precious stones. All of those manifestations of the Spirit in your life are considered by God to be character traits with applications on into eternity. In other words, it means you're a genuine believer and you are faithful. Producing those characteristically. A lifestyle then pleasing to the Lord is characterized by bearing fruit in every good work. Now, John the Baptist gives us some other practical examples of spiritual fruitfulness and good works that are pleasing to the Lord. Where I'm going with this is I want you to see, as a Christian, if you're a genuine Christian, everything you do with the intent to honor God, to minister to others in the name of the Lord, everything you do is gold and silver and precious jewel to the Lord from his perspective. Because it's the product of the Holy Spirit within you, refining you, conforming your image, your, your, your thinking, your, your worldview to his. See, Those things that are burned up might be the, exactly the same works but with wrong motives or with sinful attitudes. See? But we have within us the resident teacher and equipper so that we can and should be honoring God with everything we have. In Luke chapter 3, this is John the Baptist. He came, as you know, proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Those who wanted to demonstrate their heart toward God came to him for ceremonial cleansing in the waters of baptism. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. So John the Baptist began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized to him, you brood of vipers. Matthew tells us that he said that more specifically to the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders who, who were not genuine. But here, Luke, it's going to everybody. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, John the Baptist was a straight shooter. <laughs> he just said it like it was. Therefore, here it is, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. If you're going to claim repentance, then act like it. That's what he's saying. And do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham for our father. In other words, we're Jewish. We're good with God, right? For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying to them, well, what, sh what then should we do? How am I supposed to demonstrate the genuineness of my repentance is the question. What then should we do? And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. In other words, sharing with others is the fruit of repentance and it's a good work that pleases the Lord. Withholding from others then would be the opposite. If you can share with somebody who needs something and you have it and you choose not to, that would be worthless to them and to the Lord. See? Some tax gatherers, tax collectors also came to be baptized. They said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. In other words, 
honest business dealings and honesty in general is a good work. The product of honesty, the product of the spirit within the believer. Some soldiers were questioning him saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely. You can see there what they were doing. They were taking money that they shouldn't be taking from people because they had the force to do it, the ability to force them to do it, and they were accusing people falsely. And be content with your wages. So again, honesty, integrity, contentment are all actions and attitudes that are pleasing to the Lord. Paul gives us some additional practical examples of spiritual fruit and good works that please the Lord. I'm going to read here from Timothy chapter 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 6. The first one is an example of widows. Now they had in the early church a widow's ministry and a list that would list those widows who were qualified to receive benefits and here he gives the qualifications. A widow is to be put on the list only if she has not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, which was something when, when they came to visit, came into your home, it was a humble thing. Remember, Jesus did it with his disciples wash their feet because they would be gathering dust and dirt off the, um, off the roads and they were coming into a place and they would take their shoes off and need to have their feet washed. And that was a servitude, but it was humbly uh, beneficial to them and also pleasing to the Lord. So if she is humble of heart is what it amounts to. Wash the saints' feet. If she has assisted those in distress and if she has devoted herself to every good work. In other words, what, what has characterized her life? She's qualified in terms of she has no children to support her, so the church needs to support her or help support her. But what is her character like? She's characterized by being a woman of good works. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 17 through 19. This is for the rich. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. In other words, remind them that they are dependent on God. Remind them of the source of their wealth. Not their jobs, it's not their inheritance, it is God. Instruct them to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Store up treasure in heaven, the point. Do good works, be rich in good works. So kind of bringing this down to us. When you minister to others in any capacity, you are building with gold, silver, and precious stones. When you, show, when you show hospitality or generosity, when you minister your spiritual gifts, when you pray with others, when you pray for others, when you give to advance the Lord's work, when you encourage others in the faith or just in life in general, when you encourage others, when you show mercy, when you prepare a meal for someone who is ill or recovering from surgery, when you bake a pie, a custard pie for your pastor, no, never mind. <laughs> Not sure how that got there. Anyway, I think you get the picture, okay? Everything you do in the name of Christ and for his glory stores up riches in heaven, and such good work should permeate our lives. Works that suffer loss are works of disobedience, legalism, uh, those done with wrong motives, those done out of ignorance. If you're familiar with the life of Paul, Paul said to Timothy, God had mercy on me because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul knew that he had a whole history of things that were going to burn up because of all of the, the, the assaults on Christ through his church, 
assaults on Christians. He dragged them into court. He was responsible for many of them being put to death, and he knew that, and he never got past that. He called himself the chief of sinners because he understood his past. Okay. But still, he teaches us in this passage to work with gold, silver, precious stones, so that we would gain a maximum reward. I have other examples, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to give them to you. I want to go to the passage and just look at it in overview, these five verses, very briefly. First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Please follow along as I read it. Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is ve a very little thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not acquitted by that. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Let me give you this in overview. First of all, the spiritual leader is a servant. I've mentioned this before, and Paul will mention it again. Let us, verse 1, let us regard or let man regard us in this manner as servants. Don't put us on a pedestal. We're not exalted. We're not to be fought over. We're not to be divided over. We're not to be boastfully identified with, well, I am a Paul and I am a Peter and I am a Apollos. That, that is illegitimate. Don't do that. We are servants. The word he uses for servant here is huperetes, which is a Greek word that was used of galley slaves, under rowers, the lowest of third level galley slaves, the lowest of low in terms of the social strata. If you're going to look at us, don't exalt us. Look at us for what we are. We are servants of the living God. We are third level galley slaves, important to the running of that ship, but not exalted. The picture is that of an under rower who is a subordinate and is part of a team and is acting under the commands and directions of another, which is exactly what Paul was doing. We could add 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants. There he uses the word diakonos, from which we get deacon, which referred to table waiters. And I've told you before, a deacon a servant of God, is charged with getting the message of the gospel and the message of God's word out of the kitchen onto the table where people can partake of it without messing it up. Keep it the way it was prepared. Keep God's word the way it is presented in Scripture. Don't add to it. Don't take from it. Don't stick your finger in the pie or whatever. Just get it there. And get it there with integrity. Deacon. The spiritual leader is also a steward. Verse 1 again, let a man regard us in this manner as stewards of the mysteries of God. The Greek word translated stewards is oikonomos. It literally means a house arranger, one who manages, oversees, and dispenses the goods of another, which is exactly what Paul was doing, which is exactly what you do. When you communicate God's word, the gospel or biblical principles to others, you are taking what belongs to God, that precious treasure of the word of God, which is his very word, and communicating it to others. You are a steward of that. You are a custodian of that. We have a home in California and a property management company is overseeing that for us. And we expect them to do a good job. We're paying them to do a good job. God expects us to do a good job. He has already bought us. The, the payment, if you will, I don't want to stretch the analogy too far, but the payment is rewards okay, for the faithfulness of our service. But especially for church leaders, we are servants and we are stewards, which is the other word that he uses, and let a man regard us in this manner as stewards. Stewards of what? Of the mysteries of God. 
Now, I've told you before, a mystery in Paul's definition is something that was not known but now is known. It's been revealed. And there are many mysteries in Scripture. He's talking here primarily about the mystery of the gospel and his stewardship of the mystery of the gospel. But there are many mysteries. Let me just read them for you. Don't even try to write them down because I'm, I'm going to do it quickly. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 13. The mystery of Israel's current blindness. The mystery of the church as the body and bride of Christ. The mystery of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That was not understood before. It is understood now. It's been revealed. The mystery of sin and iniquity. Christ as the incarnate fullness of the Godhead is a mystery. Christ as the only means of salvation and eternal life is a mystery. And the mystery of freedom from the law through grace. That's a mystery that Paul spent a lot of time explaining to the Galatians. And there are many more. That's just kind of a, a sampling. The mysteries of God. Mysteries of God entrusted to those who proclaim Christ. And thirdly, the spiritual leader must be trustworthy. Verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. And that word means exactly what we have it in the English. Faithful, dependable, reliable. We must be reliable stewards and servants of God. We must be. Jesus used the same word in his Matthew 25, uh, 21 commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. We all want to hear that, or we should all want to hear that when we stand before the Lord. And then finally, the spiritual leader must not be self-exalting. Must not be self-exalting. He mustn't seek the approval of others. This is a tough one. When we're living for Christ and attempting to communicate Christ, we must not seek the approval of others. We must not rely on the approval of others. We must not be swayed by the approval of others. Verse 3, But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. Paul's ministry, Paul's message, Paul's methods, Paul's motives had all been examined by countless people, by numerous Jewish leaders and government officials, by numerous legal courts, but all of their examinations, all of their critiques, all of their conclusions meant very little to Paul as long as he was faithful in proclaiming the mysteries of God. He felt the same way toward the Corinthians. He loved them. He wanted God's best for them. He poured his life into them, but he wasn't at all dependent on their approval. We mustn't seek the approval of others. We also mustn't seek self-justification. Paul said in verses 3 and 4, In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Even as Christians, we can be experts at justifying or minimizing our own sins. And at the same time, we can be painfully inept at rightly judging our motives. It's not only possible, but it happens. I know from personal experience. Paul knew that about himself. So even when his conscience was clear, he knew nothing obvious that violated his relationship with the Lord. He didn't trust his own heart. Even the redeemed heart can be deceptive. That's why knowing God's word is so important and then conforming our lives to it. I, I have heard so many, and I've done it myself in the past, but I've heard so many professing believers say, I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm sure the Lord approves of this behavior when scripture absolutely forbids it. Self-justifying, even to the point of thinking that what we're doing is somehow honoring the Lord. I've heard that. I've heard that from family members, many people. Something that is clearly contrary to Scripture being approved by them because they have justified their own sin or seared their own conscience so that it didn't convict them to the degree that it should. So I ask, how are you doing in that area? 
Are you allowing the opinions of others to hinder your service to Christ? Are you allowing fear of not being accepted or being rejected to somehow silence you when you should speak? Or somehow divert a righteous act when you feel it may not be accepted by others? We struggle with this. I, I know we do. I'm not impugning you. I just know it happens because peer pressure and the pressure from the world can be very strong and it can also be very subtle. So we have to be guarded. The other side of that is maybe others' opinions bolster your own ego so that you kind of slip into the attitude of, boy, is, is, is God lucky to have me on his team? You know, I'm doing really well. That's the other side of it. So the opinions of others, if we're, if we're walking in a manner that pleases the Lord, the opinions of others should have no bearing on us, either positive or negative. It shouldn't shape how we view ourselves uh, when serving the Lord. Also, a faithful spiritual leader must not be self-exalting in the sense that he must seek only God's approval. But the one who examines me, Paul says, is the Lord. And the Lord alone accurately, rightly examines his servants. The Lord alone accurately and rightly praises his servants. Verse 5, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. In other words, guys, don't evaluate me. It means nothing to me. I'm talking as if I'm Paul. It means nothing to me that you exalt me. It means nothing to me that you don't exalt me. What matters to me is what Christ views of my motives and Christ views my actions. He's the one who rightly and accurately judges me, critiques me, evaluates me, and he will bring the praise, and that's the only praise that Paul was interested in. He didn't want the praise of men. So now that brings us back to the judgment seat of Christ. When Paul stands there, he's talking about gaining the praise from the Lord who knows the quality of our works, he knows the secrets of our motives, and he will dispense rewards or loss. So there are three primary takeaways, three primary applications I want to leave with you just by way of review. First of all, Everything you do in the name of Christ and for his glory stores up riches in heaven. I want you to just be confident in that. As a Christian, everything you do that honors Christ is storing up riches in heaven. Those are the words of Christ. Such good works should permeate our lives. Secondly, works that will suffer loss are works of disobedience, legalism, uh, works, even good works that are done with wrong motives or even with right motives, but like Paul, contrary to the Word of God, done out of ignorance. And then thirdly, it is Christ who rightly judges the motives of one's heart. He accurately judges. I've heard a number of people, sadly, say, when, when you try to correct them and they're doing something that's, that's clearly incorrect biblically, uh, you have no right to judge my heart. God knows my heart. See, not talking about that here. We're talking about the fact that God discloses his, his will in his word and quite often we can maybe um, confront a believer, and I've been confronted in the past too, but confront a believer who's doing something that is wrong sinfully and have them respond, well, who are you to judge me? You know, God knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. That's why he wrote in his book that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And why he has encouraged me, in this case, to confront you and lovingly rebuke you. And so we don't want to hide behind that, the fact that we're not to be judged by others. What Paul here is talking about is the fact that human judgments about him as a minister of Christ, a servant of Christ, are not valid because Christ is the one who judges his heart and he couldn't even defend himself. He's, I, I, I don't even examine myself. The implication there is because the man's heart is, it can be so deceptive. We don't always see things clearly, properly, biblically. 
That's why we must, and I'll close with this, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Please bow with me. Father, it is, it's an enormous privilege to be your servants, to be the stewards of your mysteries, to be the ones who communicate your love and your will and your word to those in our families, to those in our sphere of influence. As you know, we need boldness. Paul prayed for boldness. We pray for boldness. Pray, I pray that we would remember to pray for one another. I pray that we would be bold this coming week as you give us opportunities to live for you and to speak for you and to serve you. Help us to be very in tune with those opportunities and to maximize them as we have opportunity. Thank you for using us in that way. Thank you for calling us to be your ambassadors. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand, please. We're going to close our service with hymn number 278. This is a reminder of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross to make it possible for us to be his stewards, for us to be his servants, for us to be rewarded with gold, silver, precious stone, and to avoid um, spending our lives on things that will be burned up, wood, hay, and stubble. Hymn number 278. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. The Jesus as the east is from the west, you've separated our sins from us, past, present, and future. Help us to walk in a manner this week that is worthy of you and reflective of your love and your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.